I will give two more minutes to let everyone who's behind join us. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today for our ALS webinar Wednesday series. My name is Alejandra Herrera and I'm the marketing coordinator for ALS North America. I will be facilitating the webinar today. If you're having technical issues with our webinar platform or if you have any questions, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. You can also select the hand icon to notify me of your status so I can assist you. All questions regarding the webinar material will be answered at the end of the presentation. Our presenter today is Roger Mendel. Roger has over 25 years of experience. He has worked with ALS for over 10 years, managing engineering services and as a general manager for ALS Industrial in Australia. For the past four years, Roger has been fulfilling the role of Business Development Director for ALS Tribology in Phoenix, Arizona. Today, Roger, Roger will be discussing Fluid Analysis ROI, Real World Examples. Roger, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, Alejandra, and welcome everybody to another uh, Webinar Wednesday. Um, hopefully everyone's enjoying the uh, wonderful summer. I'm certainly enjoying it here in Phoenix at the moment. So as Alejandra mentioned, I've been, um, I've been working uh, in various parts of technical services for the last 25 years. I've, I've worked in engineering, inspection. I've worked uh, throughout consulting. I've worked in a lot of various laboratory environments and what have you. And one common theme with any form of technical service as, as um, for any sort of service in business is there's always a recurring uh, need to, to demonstrate return on investment for our services. And sometimes our services are driven by regulatory requirements, um, such as emission testing, a lot of the environmental testing we do, tank inspection, pressure vessel inspection, things like that. They're driven by regulatory requirements. But when it comes to condition monitoring and some of the um, services that we offer through the industrial division, there is no regulatory requirement. Um, and it's more important, if you like, to offer um, and demonstrate return on investment. So today I'm essentially going to be providing more of a commercial presentation. And I'm particularly going to be honing in on some of the business drivers for performing condition monitoring and specifically uh, industrial fluid analysis, which is one form of, of uh, condition monitoring. So just as a quick agenda, I'll provide a quick overview of condition monitoring and some of the various forms. Um, then I'll hone in on fluid analysis and the current demand for traditional lab-based fluid analysis. Why do we perform fluid analysis? Um, what are the key goals? And one of the key goals that I'll be uh, focusing on with regard to the return investment tool is predictive maintenance and, and the way fluid analysis is, assists with predictive maintenance. But I'll also mention some of the other drivers that are driving fluid analysis at the moment. I'll then take you through some real life examples of some of the tools that we use and some real life examples of, of clients um, that we've essentially used the tools with. Uh, so we have tools that determine optimal sampling frequency. We also have tools that actually demonstrate return on investment based on the feedback 
that our clients give us. And I think it's important um, to really show, particularly in the current um, economic environment, we're seeing, we're, we're certainly not seeing a decrease in demand for condition monitoring. We've actually seen, there was a bit of a flattening throughout the COVID period, but particularly in the last um, sort of three to six months, we've seen definitely a, a ramp up in demand, particularly uh, in the manufacturing and mining sectors. So as a quick overview, condition monitoring, um, at ALS, we provide all forms of condition monitoring. The four key areas of condition moni monitoring are fluid analysis. So this is oil, coolant, fuel, industrial fluid analysis. Vibrational analysis is also a very traditional and popular form of condition monitoring of assets. Thermography and ultrasonics. They're the four key areas of measuring the condition of assets. Now, with regard to condition monitoring, it can be either route-based or it can be continuous. Um, route-based is the more traditional form where we essentially, whether it be vibration analysis or fluid analysis, we're essentially collecting samples on a periodic basis. And we're then analyzing them offsite and doing the diagnostics on a, on a routine basis, let's call it. With regard to continuous monitoring, this has certainly ramped up a lot in the last I'm going to say the last 20 years, and particularly in the last five years, um, ALS employ a variety of um, sensor technologies and what have you, where we're continually monitoring um, the vibration of equipment and the and the um, and the fluid. We've got online oil sensors as well that we sometimes utilise. Um, so that's certainly become a um, a useful part of the entire CM program. But for the purpose of today's webinar, I'm focusing purely on traditional route-based fluid analysis, which is essentially someone collecting a sample from site, um, whether that be the customer or one of our people, sending it to one of our laboratories and us testing it and providing the diagnostics. So as I mentioned earlier, condition monitoring is not is typically not a regulatory require, requirement. A lot of people in the past have compared it to going to the gym. So it's essentially, something we know is good for the equipment, good good for us going to the gym. It's not required, but we know if we continue doing it and a bit like regular visits to the doctor, if we continue to do that, we're gonna get a really good um, understanding of the, of the health of the asset. And we're essentially going to be able to predict and, and action um, issues before they become catastrophic failures. You can see the diagram on the left there, on the right, sorry, showing the early detection of where, and if that's actioned, it can very, very quickly. And, and of course, oil analysis is typically a very early indicator of problems. And the diagram there on the right is, is actually showing the, the intervals of failure in progress. And if we action the results of oil analysis or other forms of condition monitoring, we're going to be able to prevent those catastrophic failures very early in the piece. The earlier we detect and the earlier we mitigate, the lower the cost. Um, my last point there, return, the return on investment though is only achieved if results are actioned and integrated within the maintenance program. So one thing we've seen a big um, drive uh, in the market of late is better ways of getting our information, our, our data and our actionable information into the customer's maintenance program. So we've worked very closely with a lot of customers, a lot of, across most industry sectors around the best way to report the data and get it into their maintenance program so that it gets actioned. So with regard to fluid analysis and the current demand, it's, it's still very, and it's always has been a very, as I mentioned earlier, a very early indicator of issues. And it can potentially, I, I have there a, a classic uh, Pareto uh, curve. This is actually taken from a, a steel mill in Australia, but it, it's essentially showing the Pareto principle whereby 80% of consequences are often caused by 20% of the causal factors. So in this case, 60% um, of the actionable faults at this particular plant can be related to lubricant related issues. And this is, again, this is real data from, from a real steel mill. But we see this in mining, we see it across um, mobile fleets, we see it in, in many areas. Lubricant related issues are often the causal factor
for many of the, the problems that they're having. It's very important, to, this, this enhances the, the importance of monitoring fluids. Um, and it still remains a very reliable and cost-effective condition monitoring tool. So for the, for the sake of a 10 to $20 sample, um, you're getting a lot of information and, and a lot of diagnostic on the health of that asset. As you can see here, the current demand is still across pretty much every industry sector. There's a bit of a cross-section of, of key customers that we service. So we service everyone from lubricant suppliers and they, they typically have our fluid analysis in there as a, uh, not only are they providing a high quality lubricant, but they're providing the, the um, analysis as part of the overall um, service offering to their, their, their end user. We also have major OEMs. We, we, we work with major fleet. We work across most of the major mining groups, manufacturing groups throughout the world. Um, as you can see there on the left, pretty much every industrial se sector, oil analysis is utilized in, in one way or, or another. So with regard to current demand, um, there's been a steady increase and there still is an increase. Um, it commenced, in fact, I think, Got a bit of trivia there the other day. That laboratory, there's a, a there's our network of um, dedicated oil analysis and fuel analysis labs in, in, in North America. We obviously have um, many other ALS sites throughout America, but they're the ones that are dedicated to industrial fluid analysis. And I believe that Cleveland site that you see there was one of the first ever commercial laboratories in North America. I think it actually originated from a, a rail yard um, laboratory, but um, yeah, we've been going since the mid 50s and the demand has continued. In North America alone, we would analyze over two and a half million samples a year. Um, during COVID, as I mentioned earlier, the focus on fluid analysis and condition monitoring in general hasn't, certainly hasn't dropped. In fact, it's, it's probably gone up as far as the demand goes. We did see a slight decrease in samples there for a period, particularly in mining and manufacturing where it was difficult for people to go to site and actually collect samples. But that was more due to travel restrictions and um, restrictions with regard to people getting to work. So we, we, with lab-based fluid analysis, you essentially still need somebody to collect the sample from site. And there was a period where that got uh, delayed a little due to COVID, but we're, we're certainly well and truly back to normal now. Um, so why perform fluid analysis? The number one reason and the reason, um, one of the most popular reasons is to basically move maintenance practice from reactive and preventative to predictive and proactive. So essentially moving the business and moving that their maintenance program from a expensive reactive mode, as you can see in that bottom right picture, to a more planned and targeted form of maintenance. Condition monitoring essentially provides us with a pre-warning system. So it highlights impending problems before and, and the need for maintenance before they come, become significant as per that, um, that interval curve that I showed previously. There's a much lower cost of mitigation. As I said earlier, that the, the sooner that you can detect problems and mitigate them, typically the maintenance cost is much lower. So it's much lower cost to um, replace a filter and replace the fluid, then allowing that filter and that contaminant to flow through the system and damage the system. It's far lower cost to replace filters, clean the system um, early on in the piece. And you can only, you only know to do that if, if you're monitoring the fluid. Decrease in downtime and loss of production. That's an obvious one. Um, as far as scheduling maintenance, um, Maintenance managers and plant managers, fleet managers, they use our analysis to determine how to target their maintenance. So instead of essentially doing periodic maintenance, often that may not even be required, they're using their maintenance teams to target the problematic assets. And that's essentially how condition monitoring is used. And a lot of sites actually use it to monitor root cause parameters. So it's a bit like running a safety program it's picking up the near misses, it's picking up the issues, and it means that you can mitigate those issues before they become a problem. And you're actually determining the root cause parameters and you're also through oil analysis, able to set thresholds based on trends. Other reasons, so this, this will be the, I'll, I'll be showing you some return investment tools and some other tools later in the, in the presentation 
they will be focused primarily on this particular outcome and this, this particular benefit of oil analysis. Other reasons people use oil analysis, um, certainly for, for improving asset re resale value. So with a lot of dealerships, with a lot of asset owners, if they're able to provide a history of condition monitoring with the asset, it's a bit like providing a, a maintenance logbook. It's very, it, it certainly improves the, the value of the asset when, when you go to resell it. Um, a lot of the OEMs and fluid suppliers that we work for, they use it for, to, to, it's a value add with regard to their product and the customer support they offer. It can also be used to resolve disputes from a, from a customer support perspective. Um, a lot of customers are also using it as part of their, part of their warranty uh, program. So it's used to either um, validate a warranty claim or provide backup with regard to that, that, that warranty claim. Um, it can also decrease the number and size of warranty claims. If, if there's evidence to show the root cause was not related to the actual asset, but more the, the, the application or more end user issues, then that, that the oil analysis can be used in that regard. So it can be used as a forensic tool in that regard. A lot of major fleet and plant use it to optimize drain intervals. So very, very popular with, um, as I say, major fleet, major rail groups, major um, mine sites and what have you. If they can minimize drain intervals, not only are they saving and um, saving on actual lubricant product, but they're also saving on the downtime when a drain is required. Um, so a lot of our fluid suppliers and OEMs also use it to assist with future product design. So if we're picking up a particular issue in a fluid or, or an asset type, they can use that data to actually improve the product design for future use. So what I'll do now is I will begin to share my screen and, I, and the key areas I want to take you through, and I've got this here as a backup, I want to take you through some of our um, tools that we've developed to assist asset owners. Um, this first tool is essentially a tool for um, optimizing your sampling frequency. I'm going to leave this here as a backup, but Alejandro, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. And the second tool I'll show you is our return on investment tool. So let me quickly jump in here and share my screen. I'll try to show you the mechanics of how these work. So let me firstly take you into our sampling frequency calculator. So the way this tool works is if you are setting up a program, typically, and, and we've divided, by the way, with both tools, we've, we've essentially categorized assets into either industrial or, or fixed asset and over the road or mobile assets. So we're, we're essentially breaking asset groups into two areas. If I went, actually, I'll go into, um, I will go into over the road. So I'll go into a typical example. If we were working with a client and determining best sampling frequency, it, they would be over the road and then we'd look at the type of um, component that they're looking to sample. So let's take a very common one being a, a uh, diesel engine. Now typically with regard to, typically there is a um, normal testing frequency that's nominated by either the OEM or by the, by the lubricant supplier or even by ALS. There will be a standard um, there'll be a standard um, sampling frequency with some asset types. If I was to go into industrial, I've actually put some in there that are fairly common. Let's say industrial compressor. See how 500, every 500 hours is, is come up as a default that we typically nominate for a compressor. Um, sometimes it comes up, sometimes it doesn't, but with over the road, typically, whoever we're dealing with will have a nominated interval. It may be 25, let's call it 25,000 miles. So let's say that they, they've nominated for their fleet that they sample every 25,000 miles. What this tool actually does is it actually recognizes the fact that every asset, not every asset is the same. So each asset will have a different history associated with it. It will have a different operating environment that it works in. So we've, We've used those factors down here to provide at the end of it all an adjustment factor. So with some assets, you may not need to sample that frequently, but with others, you may need to actually sample 
more frequently. As an example, I'm thinking of one I worked with um, a few weeks back. These guys had a big fleet of delivery um, vehicles. They had long haul, but they also had short haul. In both cases, it was mostly refrigerated vehicles. So the economic penalty of failure was pretty high. So I, I think I put that up around a 0.25. What they don't want is an unplanned failure, particularly if that refrigerated vehicle is full of food. They'll lose quite a bit of revenue in that regard. Um, duty cycles, I was talking to them about their short haul. So they actually have very high duty cycle. They're stopping and starting the asset all of the time. So I'd be putting that as high as well. Machine age, I think it was middle. By the way, with these tools and these tools, we can, um, they'll have definitions as we, as we go to different areas. If, if you're a bit, let's call it uh, unfamiliar with some of these terms, there'll be definitions across the top. And by the way, as far as getting access to these tools, um, at the moment, it's purely by login. So you need to apply for login credential, but we are looking to actually add some of these tools to our online uh, report, our web proof system. But at the moment, you just need to apply with ALS for login details if you're um, keen to use a tool. The tools are consultative too. So if you're um, keen to do some of this analysis, I'm more than happy to have myself or one of our team take you through these tools. But essentially, as we work through this example, so this, let's call it a middle-aged um, piece of equipment. Test parameters, this is a big one, particularly in industrial scenarios where they're looking at very high cleanliness um, parameters, but we're gonna call this normal. This particular client, they did have a history of failure. So I put that up um, a bit higher. I think I put it at mid. So what you can see here is because this has got very high duty cycles, high economic penalty of failure, and it's got a history of failure, we've come up with an adjustment factor of 0.6. So we're actually recommending that the sampling frequency on this particular asset be at every 15,000 miles rather than every 25,000 miles. So that's essentially how this tool works. It works for both a fixed asset and um, mobile asset, um, but very useful tool. And as I say, if, if, if you're keen for a more in-depth demo of that one or, or you wanna get access to it, we are more than happy to arrange that. So now let me jump into the return on investment app. So this one actually utilizes the previous tool in a lot of ways. Let me take you into an example. I'm gonna take you into a, and again, we, we, we've essentially categorized the clients into industrial and over the road or mobile. But let me take you in a, into an example and take you through the mechanism of how this works. So with this particular client, I'm looking at it now. So this, this, is, a, this is actually a, a um, onshore drilling group. So what they have here is a wire line. And again, this is a real life example. So this is a, a client that myself or one of our BD team has actually consulted with. We've talked to them about their assets and the return on investment, the business case for doing an oil analysis program, a lab-based oil analysis program. So these guys have, um, we're looking uh, primarily at their wireline unit here, and we're looking at various components of their wireline unit. The way the tool works, and, and most of these industrial clients might have already done some sort of criticality assessment on their plant. So th this particular parameter doesn't actually affect the calculation. It's more one that they put in as part of our discussion. We determine whether it's rated as critical or medium. With these wireline units, um, I would say they've got multiple, well, I know they have numerous wireline units. Um, so they've put them as, as a medium. But the way the tool works is for each component within that asset, we put it into our unit here. And in this case, they're looking at their gear system. But if it were bearing, let's put that in. See how these parameters on the right here change? I'll put it back to gear. So some of the smarts of this tool is if we, if we have a client that has currently doesn't have an oil analysis program in place, we essentially um, take into consideration here the likelihood of us picking up a problem in their fluid. So when we do oil analysis, as many on the call will know, we typically give the sample a severity rating. So we either rate it normal, cautionary, abnormal, or severe. Across the board, now I'm thinking about the number. I would say um, this is around 75% of the samples that go through our laboratory would come back as normal. 
Um, so what we've done here is for different component types, we've used data sets. So this is a set of over one and a half million samples that have gone through ALS laboratories. And what we've determined for samples that come from gears, 11.8% come back with an ab abnormality of some sort and 9.9% come back with, severe, with a severe, severe rating. And we've given therefore for, for gears, we've given it a, a weighted severity. That weighted severity is essentially the likelihood that, that we'll pick up a problem in the fluid. So again, we're taking into account the fact that many of the samples that go through the laboratory come back as normal. And there's a misconception out there, and I've heard this before, where a client might be getting 90% of their samples coming back as normal, and they're therefore thinking that they're safe, that there's only 10% of samples are abnormal, therefore, they, is there much value in running fluid analysis? This tool is designed to take that into account and demonstrate the fact that it's that 15% that are severe, they're the ones that even they're the ones where we're getting the return on investment and it takes that into account. So this factor comes into the equation. They have a thousand of these components. So that, that's number of components. This is the typical um, testing frequency. So that previous tool I showed you, um, that's, this is where you'd use that. If, if you're determining on a the example we looked at was diesel engines. If you're determining that a, a typical, that asset's doing 50,000 miles a year, then you need to test it twice a year if it was a 25,000 interval. Um, we then look at the cost to take sample, uh, sorry, to, to do the sampling. And again, in here, we, we not only monitor the cost of, this is the cost you might pay ALS. This is what you pay ALS, but we take into, the, into account the cost of actually collecting the sample, the cost of shipping the sample, the cost of, I'm not sure what this other is, but we have notes here. So in this case, they said, yes, we'd have to do, a there'd be administration involved. They'd report, they'd, they'd review our report. So that's what that other is. So we take in a, into account, not only the cost that of, or what, what would be paid to ALS, we take into account all of the other costs. So that back here, you have an overall cost of 3850. Penalty uh, failure reduction factor, again, we can, we're taking into account the fact that even if you're doing oil analysis, you're never ever going to pick up all failures. So the, it, it's essentially the um, reduction factor of failures. If you were doing other forms of condition monitoring, we can add that into this uh, tool. So that would add to this cost, but it would, it would add to the cost of sampling. So let's say, for example, you're doing online vibration monitoring or route-based VA or what have you, you could quite easily add that cost in here. What that would essentially do is improve the failure reduction factor. The more condition monitoring you can do, essentially the more likely you're going to reduce failure. So that would come in here too. We then go to the next parameter here, the mitigation cost. So in this case, with the wireline units, any mitigation they do, they can do offline. So what they, what they told me here, and I do remember this one now, they're saying that the maintenance will take 10 hours, but the beauty of it, and it looks like they're putting about $50 an hour to labor and a $500 to parts. So I'm assuming they were thinking about the, the bulk of their problems could be to do with filtration, what have you. So I'm assuming that would be uh, replacing lubricant and filter and that type of thing, or maybe hoses. Um, but the, the good thing here is there's no production loss. So um, it's all done offline. So they're not interrupting pr production. That's the beauty of doing failure mitigation. Often it's planned so you can do it while the, while the asset's still making money. Um, we then look and you'll see that cost of a thousand goes in the calculator here. Now here's the big one. This component failure cost is the cost in a world where no oil analysis or any condition monitoring at all is being done. So essentially what this return on investment tool is doing, it's comparing the world where you do condition monitoring and you're mitigating failures versus the world where you don't have any oil analysis and you're essentially flying blind. If there is a catastrophic failure, this is what this customer has told me will happen. They're saying there'll be six hours to replace the component for a gear. Um, that's a $10,000 replacement because it's a catastrophic failure. 
But this is the big one. There's $120,000 loss in production because it's a catastrophic failure. It's shutting the asset down. And they're telling me that this asset generates $20,000 an hour in revenue. So six times 20,000 is where that 120,000 comes from. So they lose 120,000 in revenue if that gear system fails catastrophically or unplanned. And you can see that in the calculator here. We then go through and we look at other components and you can see with the winch, it's come up with its own um, weighted severities. The generator is interesting. So what this is telling us is with a generator, obviously samples that have come through our laboratory, again, we're using it based on a big sample set of the 1.5 million samples that have come through, the ones that are generators have come back with not that many issues with regard to oil analysis. So at the end of it all, so we, we've looked at the, the costs of doing, failure, doing um, oil analysis, the cost of failure mitigation versus the cost of not doing any of this. There's also a tab here for additional cost savings. So as I mentioned earlier there in the webinar, there's things like resale value, there's things like warranty support, life extension on the asset. Optimizing drain intervals can be a massive saving. So a lot of, a lot of the times I've gone through this tool and our, our team's gone through this tool with customers, one of the big savings, and this applies particularly to rail and major fleet, they've had huge savings due to the oil analysis on their um, drain intervals. You can put that in there. In this case, this client hasn't added anything in there. We then look at the overall results. And for each component type, it, it gives you a cost saving for every dollar spent. So obviously that first one we looked at, and particularly because of that lost production, they're getting a huge return on investment for every dollar spent. There's a relatively high likelihood that we'll pick something up in the gear fluid. There is um, massive, if there's a catastrophic failure, there's massive cost to the customer. So this would be the obvious one for them to start a program on um, straight away. You can see this um, generator further down. I think because there'll be various factors involved here, but I think because we typically don't pick up a lot of abnormalities, that's essentially telling us the likelihood of issues is relatively low for generators versus gears. Um, so their return, it, it's still a decent, um, it's still $6.71 for every dollar spent. Um, but because these guys have got so many um, components, you look at this number here, this is the total. If we go back here, you can see they've got a thousand components in each, each area. So the end number is huge. This is, this is a big, big customer. So they're, um, they're looking at it that way. The other thing I should mention is for these numbers, these stats that go in here, these are based on, again, they're based on um, statistics from our laboratory across lots of different customers. So that's our overall numbers. If it's a client or if you're a client that already has these types of statistics, there's no problem whatsoever as putting your specific details in here. So the reason these numbers are going in there, they're default numbers that are based on typical statistics that go through our laboratory. But if you've got a program that you're running right now, um, definitely we would put in the statistics that you're currently getting from your program and put them in here. So that's an industrial example. I'm just looking at the time. I'm gonna do one more real quick. Um, let's go back here and let's jump quickly. I'm gonna do an over the road example as well. Let's look at this one. Okay. So this one is a, this is a major fleet actually. You can see these guys have um, lots of components. And the customer, um, one of my colleagues went through this one with the customer. This is a customer with a big fleet and within the fleet, they have um, long haul vehicles under warranty and older vehicles that are no longer under warranty. And they've also got some short haul vehicles in there too. But same process. So we've gone through, we've looked at um, different components. So these are diesel engines with more than 10,000 miles on them. And we've looked at both the diesel engine and also the coolant system for long haul and long haul under warranty. Um, again, if I wanted to move that to a hydraulic system, you see those numbers go up. So this is a customer that's, um, this is a customer that's not currently, I don't think they had a program in place. 
because the bulk of their vehicles are under warranty and I think they would tend to turn their vehicles um, over once they get to their warranty period. So there was a little bit of a misconception that doing oil analysis wasn't um, worth their while um, purely because if they did have a failure, they'd be covered under warranty. So as we went through this um, exercise with them, then we did the same thing. We looked at um, two samples a year with these uh, longer haul ones. It looks like some of them, like with the diesel engines, they thought they'd do more frequent sampling. And I believe the reason for that is they tend to do much higher miles with these warranty vehicles versus the old ones. The older ones are more of a backup, whereas these ones, these warranty vehicles, they work really hard. They do a lot of, a lot of uh, miles or kilometers in them. And hence the uh, higher um, testing frequency. And as we work through this one, same story we did lab testing costs, sampling costs, shipping costs. Um, not a lot of commentary there, but it looks as though there's a shipping cost there. Barley mitigation cost. So when we look at this, as I said earlier, because this client had um, the, the warranty vehicles, there was no cost for labor or parts. It must be all covered under warranty. But there is a production interruption and I'm assuming that's not covered under warranty. So although this all gets changed out while the vehicle's off the road, they're losing revenue. And likewise, um, yeah, these are the typical failures. So typically when we come up with the mitigation, we look at what their historical failures, uh, what their historical failure mechanism looks like. And that's how we come up with these examples with regard to return on investment. So these guys have obviously said, we get coolant leaks is the most common thing we get with the coolant system is leaks. Um, with the, with the engines, it's typically filter changes and new hoses that are required to mitigate potential failures. When we look at this, um, when, if there is a catastrophic failure, as you can see here, there's the labor costs, but you look at the production interruption, particularly for these warranty vehicles. Um, let's look at the notes they put in here. Diesel engine replacement, three days maintenance required. So that means these warranty vehicles are typically earning $5,000 a day. So although it's covered under warranty, there is a huge um, loss to the business should that vehicle fail prematurely. And if anyone on the call has ever looked at failure curves, typically a lot of failures, they don't occur midway through the life cycle. They typically occur quite a bit at the start of the life cycle and obviously at the back end of the life cycle. So you have what they call a bath curve and failures do occur at the, at the front end during the warranty period. So. And, and these people confirm that they do get failures. I think, and the other thing I'll mention here too, so that they've got their catastrophic failure costs. This group have also added in here that by doing oil analysis, they, they have done it in the past and it does improve the resale value of their assets. So if they are reselling 10, 10 assets per year, um, I think they must be saying here, they get an extra $5,000 per asset if they can demonstrate they've been doing condition monitoring on the asset throughout. And with regard to the long haul, if they're reselling them and they're doing 30 resells a year, at $5,000 a piece, they're getting 150,000 extra per year from resale. So these guys have put that into the equation as well. And as you can see here, it's, um, it's not giving as high a return on investment for the, for the uh, warranty vehicles, because they're parts and labor included under warranty, but they're still getting a decent return on investment if they were to employ the program on those warranty vehicles. For the, for the um, warranty, uh, the, the, the no warranty vehicles, there's an obvious um, business case here to start doing fluid analysis. I'm gonna stop this here um, and I'm gonna go back to this main thing. So in summary, um, one thing I want to just emphasize is return on investment is only achieved if the results are actioned and integrated into the maintenance program. Um, that's a very important factor. And we do see a lot of scenarios, um, and I'm not going to, but major companies with very critical assets where they haven't acted on our oil analysis and things have gone poorly for them. So a big focus for many of our customers and for us is this next one. It's all about integrating our data with their maintenance program. What, what's the quickest way to get our information, our actionable information into their maintenance program 
and in, in, on, onto the maintenance um, team as soon as possible. So that's a big focus for us at the moment. Um, we've also got some very cool data analytics. I know we've got other webinar, webinars that we've run that actually show you how to read test reports, but also how to use the data analytics within our um, WebTrieve system. We have data analytics we can send to customers on a, a monthly basis as well. And essentially the analytics give you a, you're not just getting the report on a particular sample, you're getting a view of your overall plant health or your overall fleet health. And you're able to see where the hotspots are in your plant, what assets and what component types need attention. So some of the data analytics that we can bring, bring to the table again, can really assist that maintenance um, plan for your site. Um, so we, we do have tools. This isn't the only tool that we have for doing a return investment. It's, it's, it's a consultative tool. Login permissions required right now. So if you, if you need to get further access or you need further demonstration from one of the team here, um, please let me know. There's some contact details down the bottom. We, um, we continually uh, welcome feedback as well. So we're continually enhancing these tools and uh, we welcome your feedback. That, that one I just showed you, um, seems to have a really good response from customers. And again, it's, it's purely based on feedback they give us. So it's certainly not theoretical. It's purely a, um, we're risk profiling their assets and they're giving us all of the, all of the cost information that we need to, to provide a business case. So Alejandra, I think that's it for me for now. If you wanna, if you wanna move to, to questions or. Thank you, Roger, for the great content and for your expertise on this topic. Before we begin the Q&A, I would like to ask everyone to take our survey. You can find the link in the chat section. We will give you two minutes and we would love to hear your feedback. We will open the forum for questions now. Please use the Q&A function in the toolbar at the bottom of this webinar. I will give everyone a few moments to type in your questions. In the meantime, I will review some brief notes. This webinar presentation has been recorded. All participants of this webinar will receive a follow-up email once the recording is available to view. We also post our webinars on our ALS Global website and our ALS YouTube channel in the webinar playlist. Also, please follow our company page on LinkedIn as we post announcements and registration links to future webinars and other resources and updates. Okay, our first question coming in, it's from Scott. When you use the term predictive, are you meaning condition-based monitoring that produces a trend for analysis that will show when a failure is trending towards a need for intervention? Correct. Yep. There's, so there's numerous terms for it, but I'm certainly, it, it's condition-based maintenance. So your maintenance activities are um, based on the condition of the asset. Correct. We have, and just to add to that, um, we do have another webinar that shows some of these analytics that I mentioned for determining, uh, particularly for determining trends, uh, whether they be, um, whether they be, so we have a, a particular report uh, called a condition summary report, for example, that will give analytics around the, um, not only the 
percentage of severes across particular um, plant or fleet, you can hone into um, severity based on problem type, severity based on asset type or component type as well. So there's a lot of analytics we can show there. But correct, we're talking here about condition-based maintenance. It's all part of that. Okay, Matthew would like to know, how would you compare ALS to other fluid sampling providers? Do you think there's something we do better than the rest? I think, I mean, we are the, the largest, I think probably the key thing that we've tended to, and this is purely from the demand we've seen from the market, one area that we have really, um, in, in, I suppose, enhanced our services around is on the uh, data integration and the data analytics part of our service. We tend to be, I believe we still are the largest um, network of laboratories in North America. So we, we pride ourselves on our quality, our turnaround time, our ability to, to, to handle large fluctuations in workload as well. But the key, the key to all this, I think to answer that question is our ability to provide actionable information as quick as possible so that people can actually use it and um, get that return on investment from it. Um, yeah, that's probably the best way to answer it. And or the other thing I'll say is that I've, I've worked in a lot of um, various, as I said earlier, I've been in the game for many years and I've worked um, within many condition monitoring type um, companies, but also technology. And I am a, a strong believer in this lab-based fluid analysis. It, it is very, and it's complementary as well. If you do have, tend to have uh, sensor technology in place to it, they complement each other really well. So that's the other area that we've worked pretty strongly on is um, what we call integrated condition monitoring. And not just lab-based, but we're also uh, using sensors and other forms of CM to enhance um, our overall picture of the asset. Okay, uh, Jason would like to know, how fast is our average turnaround on a sample? Average turnaround time is, so the target and the KPI we have for all our labs is within 48 hours. Um, if people need results same day, they can nominate um, to have the results same day, what we call a rush nomination. Um, but the typical turnaround time, what we aim for is within 48 hours for routine testing that is. If you do need higher level, you know, debris analysis, scanning electron microscopy, or, or some form of higher level forensics done, that can take longer. Likewise, if it were fuel analysis, there's certain analysis within the fuel testing um, that need to take longer. So backdate testing, and there's, there's various tests that we need to take longer for, but for routine testing within 48 hours. Okay, we got a couple more questions. Does the ROI calculator work for any type of equipment? Good question. So yes, it does. So it's um, it's essentially designed on that um, risk profiling various assets. It doesn't matter what the asset type is. It's very much based on customer feedback, as you would have seen. So I recently did some work with a big rail group using so they were looking at their locomotives and we went through the tool on that. I've looked at it on, uh, we do a bit, a bit of work in the aviation sector. We work with Marine as well. So same tool, same, um, yep, same uh, philosophy, same tool. So to answer the question, yes, it, it's, it's yeah. One thing that does tend to vary is um, you notice some of those additional cost savings we do have people where they've really put a lot of work into optimizing drain intervals, for example. So it's some, some groups are getting, um, the, the examples I showed you, it was primarily predictive maintenance sort of benefits, but we do, we, we, with that tool, we are certainly getting into more depth around resale value, optimizing drain intervals. Some of those are other cost benefits sometimes come into play for depending on the asset time. Thank you. Matthew is saying that they're currently using one single ALS laboratory for all their fuel analysis. Are they able to use any ALS lab? Do they need to individually set up an account with each lab location? 
So we, we I think I heard um, fuel analysis mentioned there. So we have primarily um, what they need to do is reach out to those um, numbers there. We can essentially do fuel analysis, I think in four of those laboratories that I had there on the, uh, at the start. If it's more convenient for them to use one lab over the other. So for example, Cleveland tests fuel, Portland, I think Burlington in Canada. So these are all fuel testing laboratories. If you want to switch laboratories, that's no problem whatsoever. Um, we will have all your details on file anywhere. And that's the other thing I should have mentioned, regardless of where you are in North America or the world for that matter, our reporting system and our lab base, what we call our LIMS or our lab database is the same globally. So if you do, let's say you have a site in Canada that you want to do fuel testing from, then we have a lab in Burlington. They use the exact same reporting system, same lab database. So we've already got all your details on file anyway. But I would reach out to our customer service rep. If you're dealing with a certain lab, they'll be able to arrange for you to use other labs if you need to. Is there a report that generates from the calculator? Ah, yes, there is. I forgot to mention that. So with the calculator, um, I'm not live here. This is purely a slide, but you can generate either a PDF report or um, a lot of customers have wanted this. You can generate a CSV file from here. So that will include all of the notes that the customer gave, gave us along the way. Uh, you would have seen some notes sections there. So you can create either a CSV report or a PDF report from this tool. What's the quickest way to get data from ALS to get it to the customer? The quickest way, um, okay, that's a really good question. The quickest way to get the data is essentially um, is the web API. If, if that question is relating to how do they get the data from our system into their system, the quickest way is using our web API. So a lot of the bigger clients nowadays are actually pulling data from our system into their CMMS. So they might have a, um, an SAP or a Maximo or some, some sort of CMMS or maintenance um, database, and they're essentially pulling the data from our database into theirs. So if that's something that you want to look at doing, we can certainly have our IT people um, set that up for you. If you're just a, um, a straight up end user, the quickest way is to go online, go onto WebTrieve and all of the data is posted there. The minute we, as soon as we have um, analyzed and diagnosed your results, they'll go onto WebTrieve and you can access that either through your desktop or through your mobile app and you can see your results there. We by default send you a, um, a PDF of the report as well. Um, but the quickest way is either directly to go directly to WebTrieve. And if you want the data pulled into your, your maintenance program, the ultimate is having a web API that goes into your, into your maintenance program. Do we have any more questions? Well, thank you for attending our webinar today. Uh, you can contact, contact Roger for any questions and uh, please enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.